Let's now take a look at a numerical example. Now, in all these lectures, we will be looking at numerical examples that are very small. The reason we look at small example is that we want to spell out almost every step of the computation, even though it might be just an addition or multiplication, because we want to avoid any symbol phobia on the minds of some students. Okay, there's nothing mysterious about the symbols. Once you see them in action with numerical values, then you may feel a lot more comfortable with the symbolic operation. But in order to show the numerical addition multiplication within a slide or a page of the textbook, we have to stick to small dimensions. Now, in many cases, that actually uh, does not capture a key difficulty in the challenge. That is the challenge of scale. Okay, so we would not be able to demonstrate why the problem is difficult because it has to scale up. Now, in this case, it turns out that usually the scale of a single cell is not that great. But still, we're talking about, in this case, a four-user cell, which is a lot smaller than uh, any typical cellular uh, traffic that you can expect. Now, having said that, the advantage of small examples is that we can write out every step uh, in the textbook or during the lecture. So here is the GIJ values captured in a 4x4 four four tables. Okay, there are four users. And we're going to make up some number that will make our uh, computation very easy. We say the diagonal entries, which are the G11s, G22, G233, and G44, they're all the same, which is 1. Okay? And then the GIJs are smaller because of the help of spreading code for the GIIs. And G12 in general may not be equal to G21. Okay, so this is G12, this is G21. All right, now these are the given parameters depicting the channel conditions for both the direct channels and the interference channels. Now, what about the target gammas? I'm going to say that Gamma 1 is 2, gamma 2 is 2.5, gamma 3 is 1.5, and gamma 4 is 2. It turns out this set of gamma target SIRs is indeed achievable. And remember, the gammas are unitless numbers because it's the ratio. And then the noise levels, the NIs, are all equal to 0 0.1 in the units of uh, milliwatts. So that's the set of constants. And now let's take a look at what would happen to the transmit power vector over discrete time slots from initialization at time zero forward. Now, of course, in a real system, there's mobility. So you don't even have the same constant number of users. In a real system, the channel may also change before your algorithm can converge. We're skipping those important details in practice just to focus on a simple example to illustrate the dynamics of convergence of the p-vector. Now we start with an initialization or a time zero. Let's say we initialize all the power levels to be one milliwatt. Okay, now let's calculate what is the corresponding SIRs. The SIR for the first transceiver pair at time zero initialization is simply one times Let's see, this is one, okay. First one times one point zero milliwatt. Okay. And then we'll write down the similar expression for the interference. Let's say what are the interference uh, channels? Well, we got a point one from the second transmitter, point two from the third and point three as the interference channel uh, gain from the fourth uh, user. So we have to multiply point one by the transmit power for the second user, which is 1.0. And then point two times, again, 1.0 because everybody's power is initialized to be one milliwatt. And then point three times 1.0.
plus don't forget a little noise term 0 0.1 and this turns out to be 1.43 similarly we can calculate the SIR for the second user at initialization which turns out to be 2 for the third one which turns out to be 2 as well and the fourth one which turns out to be 2.5 okay if you look at these numbers these four numbers at initialization and compare with the target SIRs okay you see that the first user is not getting to the target SIR neither is second user okay. but the third and the fourth user are actually getting above their target SIRs instead of 1.5 you're getting 2 already instead of 2 you're getting 2.5 so what would you expect intuitively and mathematically you expect that at the next time iteration number one you will see that the first and second users transmit power should go up and the third and fourth users transmit powers should go down and that is exactly the kind of negative feedback that we will see okay or well, let's look at the kind of uh, powers that uh, we'll be looking at p1 okay now at iteration one is gamma one over the sir just observed times the power okay at the last iteration and this equals 2 your target over 1.43 which you're currently getting multiply your current power level 1.0 and that is 1.4 okay indeed now you're going to blast more power than before okay because you were not achieving your target SIR similarly the second user's transmit power now becomes 1.25 instead of one whereas the third and the fourth users transmit power you can easily verify the calculation are actually smaller than the last round they're 0 0.75 and 0 0.80 milliwatts respectively everything is in milliwatt for the power unit okay. and that confirms our intuition if you overshoot your target SIR, lower your power, otherwise increase your power. Now, what happens to the SIR now? The SIR at this new iteration now becomes the following. Okay. Again, direct channel gain is 1, multiply the new power, which is 1.40, divided by the interference channel gain 0 0.1 times the new power 1.25 plus direct uh, interference channel gain 0.2 times the new power 0.75 times uh, plus 0 0.3 the interference channel gain multiplied by the new transmit power 0 0.8 this is the interference plus the noise and you get 2.28 okay now notice 2.28 here now is both bigger than the last round SIR which is 1.43 if you remember as well as bigger than the target SIR2 so not only you enhance your SIR you enhanced a little too much you overshot for the first user after this round so what would you expect to happen in the next round you expect the power for the first user will now go down okay so power go up power go down and you hope that this oscillation would dampen and eventually converge let's finish this calculation okay so the second user at iteration one the SIR is 2.34 okay which is bigger than the SR at the last iteration which was 2 but not big enough yet the target is 2.5 so expect that next round the power for the second transceiver pair will still go up in the SIR 3 at this iteration uh, is 1.28 SIR 4 at this iteration equals 1.82 okay 
and both of these are not, not quite their target SIR. So what you see after one iteration is that the first user actually overshot. Okay. The second user didn't overshoot. The third and fourth user actually now they are dipping below the target SIR now. And next round, their power should increase. All right, so now you can go through this yourself. I'll look at the textbook and I'm going to just show you the cooked product. In the end, we can plot these transmit power values in milliwatts over the iterations. We just went uh, through one iteration. You can keep going and then you see the ups and down quickly saturates and around iteration 15, you pretty much converge. Now we will not have time to rigorously talk about so-called exit condition of an iterative algorithm. Okay, when should you converge to have a guaranteed uh, error bound? Uh, we'll just hand wavy ways say that if the transmit powers no longer vary a whole lot from one iteration to the next, we call that a convergence. And this induces, of course, a convergence in the target SIR uh, towards the target SIR over these iterations. In fact, um, around iteration 10, for sure, uh, the SIRs converged. And as you can see, they achieve their target SIRs. 2.5, 2, 2, and 1.5, respectively. This actually is a very fast convergence. Uh, within basically a few iterations, uh, we achieve the target SIR. Now, everything we have talked about so far, okay, the formulation, the optimization view, the game view, the numerical example, are all about what people call the inner loop power control, which says you have a target gamma feed into you and you have uh, the current SIR measured and this is going to update your transmit power. There's actually another loop, the outer loop, which operates at a slower time scale. Okay, By picking a certain transmit power through the effect of wireless network interference, you're going to observe at the, trans, uh, the receiver a certain error rate. And this error rate is an artifact of the kind of gamma that you pick. And the outer loop control says, you know what, is this too much error? If so, you should increase gamma. If not, maybe you can decrease gamma. So now in the outer loop, gamma is an output, not input. Gamma is a variable, not a constant. Now we will not have time to talk about it, but in 3G and 4G networks, clearly uh, for data-centric applications, you can't just have a target gamma. Everybody want a bigger gamma. The bigger the gamma, the higher the data rate, or correspondingly, the lower the error rate. So now you have to balance different users' demand for a bigger gamma. You know you can't give a big gamma to everyone. Then what would be an efficient and fair allocation of gamma? That is something that is very interesting. We just are running out of time. But before we close this, lecture I want to highlight in practice how is transmit power control used now we assumed that everybody has the same clock of course in reality you have asynchronous system the clocks at different mobile stations are run slightly different and the transmit power levels cannot be just any real number they can only uh, jump in a discrete way for example, the granularities might be 0.1 dB, 0.2, or 0.5 dB, depending on which uh, cellular protocol you are talking about. But if you look at an asynchronous and discrete power level version of DPC that is actually implemented in virtually all the 2.5G and 3G networks, and depending on the protocol, the frequency of running the inner loop could be uh, anywhere between 800 to 1500 hertz. Okay. So every second, roughly speaking, this calculation of DPC is run a thousand times. Now you can count how many 3G and 2.5G devices are out there. And you see that this algorithm is used with incredible number of times every single day out there. And indeed, Transmit power control together with what's called soft handoff is what made all the 3G standards work.
So not only is this DPC an elegant mathematical entity, it is also a practically extremely influential and useful artifact. Some you may wonder, how can I make cellular speed run even faster? We'll come to some of these ideas from splitting the cells, overlaying with smaller cells, to using multiple antennas and dividing the frequency bands more refinely later in the course. Well, every lecture will conclude with a summary slide. And in today's summary slide, we want to highlight two things that we learned in this very first lecture of the course. One is that different users' signals interfere with each other in the air. And that happens in all wireless communication. In the cellular world, we use transmit power control to manage this interference, to mitigate the impact of this negative externality. In particular, we saw the picture of a feasible SIR region, the trade-off, with a Pareto optimal boundary. And we saw the cocktail party analogy. In this case, we're controlling the volume of all those that talk during this cocktail party. We also saw a specific mathematical formula. It's called the interference coordination with distributed power control, a DPC. And the conceptual highlight is that there is a negative feedback, and the feedback is all captured in the current SRR value. You just compare that with your target fixed gamma and use that ratio to adjust your power level up or down accordingly in the next time slot. Now we saw that this can be viewed as a distributed solution to an optimization problem, which turns out to be a linear programming. Or we can model that as actions by intelligent agent in a non-corroborative game that models the competition due to interference. Both the conceptual points of interference, tragedy of common, negative externality, as well as the mathematical language, such as what defines optimization problem and what defines a game, will be so frequently used over and over again in the rest of this course. And indeed, in the next lecture, we will shift gear from the world of CDMA over to the world of online ad auction. How does Google sell the advertising slots on a search result page? We will see how the ideas we talked about in a game can be applied to analyze the mechanisms that Google uses. So see you at the next lecture.